All right, it's the end of the session. We have Taylor here. Uh, Taylor's mouth is open, and a lot of us interpret this mouth open as, as a smile, but this is actually stress. We just got done doing an exercise down, downstairs. I'm gonna talk about this right first. Uh, basically, um, he, so, he so much doesn't want his guardian to leave him that when she tries to close the kettle door, he bit her hand, literally, um, and he snaps at her. I, uh, and it's not resource guarding, it's that he thinks that he can prevent her from closing the door and maybe that'll prevent her from leaving. So we just went over an exercise, I'm gonna go detail this. What we wanna do is we wanna create a positive association. So I'm gonna, uh, I use the, the uh, Stevens freeze dried beef liver, we call this doggy crack. And what we wanna do is I want you to do 10 times, uh, 10 in a row, 10 treats in a row. You need to go down there with him, show him you have the treat, throw the treat in the kennel towards the back of the kennel, hopefully it doesn't bounce out. When he runs in there and licks it up, you're gonna say the word Paris every time he licks it up. So I want you to do this once an hour, tonight and tomorrow. And you have a whole bunch of crack there for it to do it. So you're gonna throw it, he goes in, licks it up, say Paris, wait for him to come out, say his name, Taylor, throw it in there again. And then after 10 times, then you come upstairs. Uh, if he stays, and eventually he should start, should start lingering in there. Um, and if it doesn't happen tonight, the link, or you won't see this till tomorrow, but if it, uh, so just practice this, remember what we're talking about right now, and you can practice this tomorrow. So basically, um, uh, tomorrow, on the hour, and, and if he does it with you too, I would maybe have you guys switch. One hour you go down, one hour you go down. And so that way we both practice going in the kennel, but we're not touching the door, we're not closing the door. Um, he just learns that just going in the kennel now, and I hear the word Paris, eventually you say the word Paris, he should go in the kennel. So thank you for the kisses, buddy. So basically what we do is, uh, is uh, that's the first step. Now tomorrow, it is once an hour, and, we, and you'll, get, you'll get this video, so you'll be watch this video as a reminder. And about seven o'clock tomorrow night, well, about six o'clock tomorrow night, I want you to throw the first treat in, he's gonna run in the kennel and get it, you say the word Paris, and then wait for him to turn around. When he turns around, we throw the next treat towards the front of the kennel at his feet. When he, when he uh, actually touches it, I want you to reach over and touch the kennel door like that, just with one fingertip. You're not grabbing it, you're just touching it lightly. And then, uh, and then you're gonna start doing that now. Every time you throw the treat in, he's gonna get two. So break the pieces of crack up into kind of bite-sized pieces, a little bit bigger than a pea, if you can. Sometimes you can't bite, but take a hammer or something if you can. So, um, and eventually, after you can get to the point where you're touching it, and he's not lunging, and he, and he probably won't be lunging tomorrow if you do this right. So then you can touch it with two fingers and kind of put a little bit of pressure down, not pressure, but hit it with a little intensity so it's making a little bit more vibration, more of a sound. And then, uh, so you throw the treat in, he turns around and gets it, you throw the second one at, at, his, uh, at his feet, and then boom. Now, we're doing this in an in inverted order to start off with intentionally. What we're gonna do then after that is, uh, you're gonna throw the first treat in, he goes in there and says Paris. And then there's gonna be an addendum. So you throw that one and he goes, you say Paris. Then I'd like you, after you've done this for four hours, where you're touching the treat. So for all, so you throw the one, click. Actually, no, two hours, one for you, one for you. So you throw the first one, he goes and gets it. Then he turns around, you throw the second one and hit it for all 10 treats. And then you do the same thing the next hour. The next time I want you to do it, I want you to do the same process for the first treat. After that, you're gonna do an important switch. You're gonna throw the first treat in there, he runs in and you say Paris. Then you're gonna to touch the door, then you're gonna throw the treat. That's important. At first we do it to make sure that he's not biting you because I don't wanna bite you anymore. But now I want to associate you touching the door, that causes the treat to fall. So instead of biting you when you touch the door, I like it when you touch the door. When you touch the door, that means I'm about to get paid. And I like getting paid with crack or treats or whatever it is. So now every time you go in there, you're gonna throw it. Now the addendum that I just mentioned is what's gonna happen is eventually you're just gonna say Paris and he'll just run in there. Then you could throw the treat at his feet and then, we, and then when he looks up, you would say Paris. After a while, you just say Paris, he'll run in there. Then you're gonna touch, and then you're gonna throw, so you're only gonna get one treat. Now this is probably not gonna be something until you do till Sunday. Um, you wanna, and if he reacts it negatively at all, you wanna back up. So do you, uh, so just to follow, just to summarize, I'm kind of riffing this, so let me summarize this. So at first you're gonna throw the treat, he goes in there and gets it, say, you say Paris, and then, uh, and that's all you do. Uh, you do that tonight. Tomorrow, what I want you to do is throw the first treat in, he goes and gets Paris, throw the second one at his feet, and then you touch it, and then uh, 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 you throw the second treat and then touch it. And you do that for all 10 treats, then he's gonna do that the next hour. The next hour, the third time you do it tomorrow, throw the first one in there, says Paris, and the second one, you're gonna touch the handle, then you're gonna drop the second treat. And uh, then I want you to keep on repeating that procedure. 
Now, if he goes in there on his own, that's what we're looking for. And he should at some point just go in there automatically. Then he can throw the treat in there uh, and say the word Paris. Now, the last stage is you're gonna, when you can get to the point where you say Paris or he just runs in on his own, he runs in there, you touch the handle, uh, or, uh, and then you drop the treat. So at that point, we're gonna go from two treats to one treat. And eventually when you get to the point where you can like hit it pretty hard and he's just not responding at all, then you can actually grab it with your fingers. Don't move it, just grab it with your fingers, then take your hand, then take your hand off and throw the treat in there. And then grab your fingers and do that for all 10 treats the first time you do it, whoever it is. Then the next time, the next person would go in there, you, he goes, you say Paris, or he just goes in there. Then you're gonna touch it and you're gonna move it a half an inch and then pull your hand back and then throw the treat for all 10 treats. Then the next time you do a one inch, then you do two inches the next hour. One treat? Uh, yeah. And so, so for that reason, so Paris, he runs in there, you touch it and move it an inch, pull your hand back and then throw the treat. So, and then each time one inch, and if it's one inch, then all 10 treats is only moving at one inch. And you can kind of move it, so maybe move it, you can move it back, it should, a lot of times they'll slide back on their own. Uh, but the idea is gradually going it closer and closer until eventually you can close it all the way and then you're dropping the treat from the top. And then the next procedure would be you close it all the way and then you lat and then just jiggle the handle. Don't latch it, just jiggle, make the sound of the handle, then drop the treat and then open the door again. And he gets to exit and we repeat this process. And after a while, you get to the point where you'll be able to close it and he's not snapping or lunging at you. And then you wait a second and then you open it, let him back out. And after when you get to this stage, what you wanna do is close it and now next time I wait for two seconds before I open it, let him out. Then three seconds, then four seconds, go very progressively. Um, and eventually you can get to the point where you get where you can where you're like waiting like 20 seconds close it Take three steps away turn around come back and undo it and let him out The whole point of this is we want to practice and understand that going in the kennel does not represent that I'm always going to be locked in there and uh, So by the time we get to Sunday Hopefully you could put him in there and he feels comfortable enough without snapping at you now the kennel is not an ideal situation for a dog that has separation anxiety because it validates kind of what we're talking about. The video above is gonna be all those things. You need to practice that stuff as well. So when you're doing all these treats, he might actually go without meals, from traditional meals from actual, uh, from the bowl because he's gonna be getting a lot of the, beef liver is very rich for him. Uh, these are chicken liver. Um, you can use your treats, just don't use the uh, begging strips. Begging strips have cancer causing ingredients and nobody should ever give it on begging strips. Um, but the idea, we get to the point where, again, we've broken it down and we've built up our trust and just going to the counter is a positive thing and it doesn't mean that you're leaving. So you want to do this as much independently. Now, when you're going to actually leave on Sunday, uh, you're going to have to put him in the kennel. Um, so what you might want to do is maybe uh, Saturday, uh, I'll leave a bully stick. Maybe put, give him the bully stick when you go in there. He probably won't chew it on Sunday, but you never know. But exercising him beforehand, take him out playing fetch or if you have a laser, have him chase laser, or take him for a walk, setting him up for success by burning that energy is gonna help in that regard. It won't, it won't fix it, but we wanna give him every advantage we possibly can. Um, and uh, when you do get to the point where in the video above where we're practicing that, if you do have to leave, and he's not gonna be in the kennel because you're gonna be here, what we'd like to do is, is, and I would order some of those bully sticks, remind me before we leave Taylor, and I'll give her the card, uh, and she can take a picture, you can order some of the bully sticks that we have. What we wanna do is have him kinda get into the bully stick, and then you already have your purse and everything downstairs, you know, maybe he's in the backyard, you put your purse and everything in the key, in the car, have your keys in your pocket so it doesn't make any sound. And when actually you're gonna leave to go run an errand, you give him the bully stick him up and just sit here for five minutes, then get up and walk to the bathroom, come back and sit back down, then walk in the living room, come back. So you're gonna leave a couple of times while he's chewing on this bully stick, and eventually when he's distracted, then you kind of quietly go down, open the door, and leave. Now you probably hear the vibration of the garage door, but at that point, we gotta leave at some point, you can't be a prisoner. But if you practice the stuff that's in the video above and teach him to stay and help him practice being alone, that's gonna give him confidence about being alone. And that way he doesn't feel like he's, we've taken away the reason for wanting to bite and all the rest of that stuff. There's, this is, these dogs have, uh, this is not, uh, this is an easy session, but there's a lot of things going on with your dogs that you need to work on. Okay, so this is now, uh, now I'm gonna go over what I tor normally do in this video, which is uh, the roadmap to success, which is a summary of what we went over. I talked about exercise several times. Teddy is a higher, or excuse me, Teddy. Uh, Max is a higher energy dog, but he is not treat motivated. I think he's very fearful, so I'm probably gonna take him to my house for a day and see how he does. But he needs more, the both dogs need more exercise. So we gotta find ways to exercise. We gotta either bring in a dog walker, we gotta get him uh, doing the treat master, uh, going up this down the stairs to get the treat. 
Um, you have a treadmill, we could potentially te teach them how to run on the treadmill. Um, it may be hard, but whatever. We gotta figure out ways to burn their energy and they need that stimulation. So if we have to, walks. Um, even if, we, and remember walks, the sniffing is the important part. Now, things that they get really anxious or aggressive about sniffing, those are things I wouldn't like. The, there's a path that kind of goes by a busy road here and they really get aggressive about wanting to go and sniff there. That I wouldn't do that. That's not necessarily, that's probably not great practice. So again, just walk maybe to the end of this block and turn around and walk back. Doesn't have to be a long walk, but I would like them to start getting walks. It'd be nice if they can walk them together because that helps them practice something positive. And outside there's a lot of distractions. It's gonna be really helpful. And again, doesn't have to be a marathon, 10 minutes walk. And it'd be good for you guys to get a little fresh air as well. Um, a minimum once a week they need to walk, minimum. But I would love to see it happening every day, even if it's just a 10 minute walk. Five minutes there, five minutes back, cross the street, remember, let them sniff as much as they want as long as it's safe to do so. Um, okay, so uh, uh, you can also, uh, we talked about some treat dispensing toys and stuff like that, but I, I don't know if that's gonna be there as helpful. It probably would for him, uh, a snuffle mat and things along those lines, but I think the walks would be better with him. That's also a little bit, does he do that often? What is he doing right now? What? Is that normal? Oh yeah, he likes it. Like, so he both the it. dogs are kind of <laughs> moving themselves in a little corners. Something you might want to consider getting is for the kennel. They make little, uh, you can put blankets on top of them. Sometimes they'll pull the blankets in and shred them. But uh, somebody's putting like uh, something to, they like caves. Dogs like a, a, a closed and, and confined area, helps them feel secure. So somebody's putting a cloth or something, or, or just cardboard or whatever, it makes that kennel seem more like a den. Because that's kind of what he's doing right there, is he's trying to kind of give himself a little protective area. Um, he's kind of burying next to the couch. Okay, so exercise is important. Find ways to exercise. Some point of those is a treadmill or the laser or whatever it is. Now, if they're chasing the laser and they're panting and drooling, that's not a healthy thing for them to do. Some dogs should chase the laser, some shouldn't. Um, but we have to increase that exercise and that stimulation. Walks is gonna be, I think, in these dogs' case, because they're older dogs, they're the best things to do. We also talked about enforcing some rules. I'm more, in, in, for, I'm more in, interested in the rules in terms of Taylor than I am for, uh, for Max. Matt, but it, it's hard when one dog's on top of the couch and the other one isn't. So I continue to let Max on the bed because he does sleep and he feels comfortable and say that's his safe zone, that's great. I would encourage him to actually hang out on top of your bed. If he's back there, just you know, do the same thing we just did downstairs, just throw, leave a treat there and come up with a word that means go on top of the bed, call it tempur or whatever the word is, fluffy. And so you say fluffy and he runs and jumps on top of the bed. For dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. And I think for in his case, artificially getting him some practice that those things would be really helpful. Um, so, um, uh, but in here, Taylor went after Max one time. He was sitting on the couch, Max came in the room and he attacked him. Sometimes a dog will attack another dog that's fearful or insecure. I'm wondering if that was a little bit or also a little bit of posturing. I'm on this, you know, uh, a heightened authoritative position and you're not, you came in the room and I'm gonna go after you. So if we take away Taylor's couch privileges, then Taylor doesn't have that to lord over Max and we take away something that is making Max feel a little bit insecure. So I recommend getting those X mats. Remember, it has the dog has to do something for at least 90 days before it becomes a behavior pattern or a habit. So I would order those X mats on Amazon. You're gonna have to probably spend about 120 bucks on them. But that, you know, after about three months, the dogs will stop getting on the furniture, or at least uh, Taylor will. Does Max get on the furniture? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because they fought over it, that I would kind of want to take away that furniture, but the bed, it would be different. That's something we want Max to have. Um, okay, so that's the first uh, of the rules. And remember, rules, you have to be in place for 90 days minimum. Uh, the next rule is sit at the door. Go to the door, tell him to sit. And I'd probably do this with them separately. Max probably won't go near the door when Taylor's going through it. That doors are hard. I actually, uh, I forgot. I was going to go over a couple things. So um, the crack that I gave you, I'd like you to have, uh, and this is probably not the best day for it, but we would like to have the dog practice going through the door. Now somebody's practicing, this is not a doorway, but if you have a little doorway to like a bedroom, a bathroom, throw the treat, and even though that's not the door that goes outside, having the practice go through doors, doors are hard for a lot of dogs. And uh, Max, uh, or Taylor doesn't like going uh, through the door, and Taylor, is Taylor or Max will stay by, by himself? Uh, Max. In the, Max will, okay. So Max, and they actually put a, uh, a leash on Max when they put him outside, because sometimes he won't come back inside. Oh no, that's That's Taylor, Taylor. okay. That's so Taylor. Taylor's guardian, uh, former guardian kind of, uh, might have kept him outside, and there might be some negatives. So what we want the dog to do is practice going in and out. So I'd have the leash, have the crack, open the door, and again, the weather's not gonna be ideal, but just do a quick. Show him the treat, throw it out, he runs out and gets it, then, then drop one inside. 
We want to practice going in and out that door without any hesitation. So he could throw the, and I would come up with a command word. When he goes outside, call it like yard. When he comes inside, call it casa or mansion. So now you have a command word. And once he reps that enough, he shouldn't have as much of a fear for that threshold. Um, might have been caught in a door. Doors are just hard, hard for dogs. Uh, now for the dog, to get the dog to come to you, remember when it comes to food, the smell is the most important. Temperature is number two. Taste is a distant third. They only have about 13% of the taste buds that we have. I would get some warm chicken, temperature. So what I would do is if you won't go through the door with a crack, get some warm chicken and just do that. And then just one step in, one step out. So uh, if, you, if he won't come to you in the yard and he runs away from you, sometimes that means that people have snatched him. So try not to snatch him. What I would do is let, put him outside, have some warm chicken, go outside, put your jacket on, go outside with that really warm chicken in your hand and walk in the middle of the yard and just stand there. Don't call him, don't look at him, just stand there. So be bundled up because it's gonna be cold tomorrow uh, or Saturday. And when he comes to you, give him the piece of chicken, say come and then go back inside and don't try to come, don't pet him, don't try to get him come in with you. Wait about a minute or a couple minutes, grab another warm piece of chicken, walk out, let's say walk 20 paces the first time. This time I want you to walk 19 paces and again, just stand there. Don't say a word. When he comes to you, give him the piece of chicken, say come, and then go back in the house. These dogs might be different, but almost everybody else, by the time you get to 10 steps, the dog is automatically coming up to you because it doesn't represent that we're going in the house, it just represents chicken. Now, a lot of times the dogs don't want to come inside because they enjoy being outside. I think he might be staying outside because he had a bad experience with a former home. And so if that's the case, that repping that's going in and out the door might help. Um, and if he won't go towards the door, you can just throw a piece of chicken one foot towards the door. He takes one step towards the door and then walks away. That's progress. Then keep on doing that until two steps and three steps. And if he won't stop at three steps, keep practicing at three steps and do that, you know, with a bunch of chicken. And then after, after a while, try the fourth step. Sometimes you'll get him there, but you have to go very progressively, like just like we did in the kennel. And eventually the kennel, he didn't want to go in there. And after a while, he just turned around and walking right back in. The same principle will happen with your door if you practice it. Now, uh, for uh, so one of the rules I usually go over the, is sit to go outside the door, but because he has an issue with the door, I might skip that. Once you fix that, a lot of times my rule is I tell the dog to go to the door, or I go to the door and the dog wants to go outside. When he's pawing or telling you he wants to go outside, those are times when I go to the door and I tell the dog to sit one time. If the dog does not sit within three seconds, I walk away and I sit down and I wait one minute. And, I, and then I go back and tell him again one time. Remember, the more you say it, the less you mean it. And keep on doubling at first I walk away with sit down for one minute, two minute, four minute, eight minute, keep doubling the length of time until eventually you say sit, his butt hits the ground. And as soon as butt hits the ground in that three second window, that's when the door flies open. So this will train him to go sit at the door and ask him to go out. But this is a rule that I probably have you wait off on a little bit until he's comfortable going in and out the door. And then in and out the door, you're gonna be giving him a lot of treats to the kennel since he's biting you. That's more of a priority for me than the door. Once you get him done with the kennel, then I would do the same uh, maybe once an hour with the, do uh, with the door. Um, okay, um, a lot of the rules that I recommend are really not a pro uh, apropos here because they don't sweat you for their food. Um, I, would, I would feed the dogs one at a time. So is Teddy, or excuse me, or Max, <laughs> or is it uh, a Taylor that's the fast eater? So if he's the fast eater, I would on Amazon order a snuffle mat and feed him out of the snuffle mat. He is actually the dog who probably could, like myself, lose a little, you lose a little bit. And so if you feed him, put his the snuffle mat down, and it'll look like a, a, a something with a, a bunch of tassels. And just put his kibble in there, shake it in there, and work it in there. So he's got to use his nose to find it, move it, and then lick up that piece of kibble. This is the exercise for him. It makes him earn his food. And I would wait until you've gotten the kennel stuff, because again, the kennel and the door is going to be basically, you're going to be feeding his meals uh, as, uh, ret uh, as you're rehabilitating him. Once you get done with that, then I'd like you to start feeding him out of a snuffle mat or the Omega Paw treat ball, which you can also get on Amazon, uh, or treat dispensing toys. That way he has to work for his food. He, uh, like I said, it'll help him uh, burn some energy and be relaxing and calming and soothing. And both of these dogs need a little soothing. Um, let me see, what else? Um, uh, one thing is you might, uh, you might want to get Adaptil. Um, if you mention it to me later on, there is some pheromones, uh, a scent thing that you can get for fearful dogs. It's like a Glade plug-in thing. It releases stuff in the air that is actually calming for dogs. I have one in my house. I might actually use it for on him uh, overnight on, on uh, uh, Saturday night if I keep him on Saturday night. Sometimes that can help. It's not gonna fix your problems, but again, if I have 10 things that help them with 3% each time, well, that's 30% that we help them. So we like to bridge it, but it's gonna be the activities that we're talking about in this video that are gonna be really more beneficial than anything else. Um, okay, so uh, normally I talk a lot about rules and structure, and you guys' case, besides the furniture, I really don't, and the door eventually, I think that's the only two that you really should work on, except for having, I would try to get Max to eat first, 
And then when Max is done, then Taylor eats after him because Taylor's kind of the more aggressive dog. Um, now, um, remember to practice the door exercise. Have friends come over, have Ma have, I don't think even, I was I like put Max away, didn't even need to worry about, Max will keep himself away. <laughs> but step on that leash, so what you wanna do is uh, have your friends call you before they come. Exercising in first would be helpful. Uh, but you're gonna step on that leash and don't use the slip lead that you have. Order a traditional st six foot straight leash is what they call it. Order one of those on Amazon. Before your friends knock on the door, they or come to your door, because you have one of those sentry things, um, call you. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna be about 12 feet away from the door, you're gonna step on the leash. The leash should probably get a, you get a six foot leash. Uh, step on the leash about this far away from where it attaches the collar. And measure it out so that if he goes, and to an extent, he can't get to that line like this from your doorway into your living room. Your guests should come in and they should be, uh, I'm gonna pantomime this while I'm down so Taylor doesn't have to adjust the camera. So if, if Taylor's here, lunging and all excited, the guest is gonna come here and be sideways to Taylor and we're not gonna say a word. And then you or you are gonna be stepping on the leash. And as soon as Taylor calms down, the guest is gonna turn and Taylor's gonna start wiggling and you turn back. And they go a whole bunch of this back and forth and back and forth. Remember, excited is not the same thing as happy. In this case, excitement I think is a cause of some of these dogs' problems. So this is a great way because it teaches the dog, when I'm calm, I'm very attractive. All these people wanna pet me. As soon as I get excited, I become invisible. But it takes the human disengaging with good timing. So don't wait for him to spaz out. As soon as you start, whip, step away. And we're not punishing, we're just saying, I don't, I don't wanna engage with that energy. And when you give me the energy that I like calmness, that's when I pet you. And after a while, and I'd like you to practice, ask your neighbors. Because a neighbor can come by and just stand there at the doorway, and then when they get done, they leave. They don't even come. In, they don't even really come in your house, and that mitigates and reduces a little bit of the excitement of when people come. Which your kids or other people that you know, and they're going to come and hang out. Oh, I can spaz out, and I can jump up, and they can pet me, and all this fun stuff. Well, now I'm practicing having people come to the door and being calm without the aftermath that causes the dogs to get all excited. Um, if you have for, if you have difficulty with that, let me know. I have videos I can share with you that show how to do that. But I think you guys can fit. Your, uh, we just did it, and you guys will get that one down fine. Um, okay, so Taylor talked to you, the human Taylor talked to you about petting with the purpose and passive training, and that's going to be crucial for your dogs more probably than just about every other session I've ever done. So when he comes up to you, if he nudges you or paws at you or barks at you, max two, they're telling you what to do. Now Max's case, he's, he's, a, he's more sensitive, but I still want Max to learn to earn it because we need to boost Max's self-esteem. We need to teach him tricks, but he is not treat motivated. And he's kind of shies away from contact, at least from us, uh, until the other dog's around, not around. So that's why I think that practice and having them, up, and before I forget, once we're doing this, he needs to spend some time in the bedroom or outside Taylor so Max can spend some time with you. And once you get to stay, having Taylor stay in the other room while you can cuddle and play with Max is gonna be really beneficial. I would like to see it 50% of the time because I don't think Max feels comfortable around Taylor. And so I want Max to have some comfort quality time with you. Because right now he's just saying, that's fine, I'll just short myself. And then it's, it's detrimental to his psyche. And he need, we need to build up his psyche far more than we do for Taylor. So at least 50% of the time, you should have time with you guys where uh, Taylor's not there. And that will actually help Taylor with practicing the separation anxiety as well. Okay, so okay. Uh, for petting with a purpose, if they come and nudge you or tell, they're telling you what to do. Leaders tell, followers ask. So when they nudge you or, I don't know, I wasn't in the room, with whatever they do. But when they do whatever it is, they nudge you or bark you or paw at you, I think he'd probably pause. I think he pawed at me. Give him a counter order, tell him to sit. If he's already sitting, tell him to lay down or sit over here. Don't shake. Don't practice shake with him anymore. Um, and then if he sits or lays down within that three second window, Pete, reach over, pet him under the chin and say only the word sit or only the word down. Not good sit, not Taylor, you're good, such a good sitter, just sit. And that sit, sit, say it in the same tone of voice. And then pet him as much or as little as you want. After a while, he'll realize I can't tell the humans what to do anymore. I have to ask. And better than ask, I have to pay for the privilege of their attention. And I pay for it through a currency of obedience. And the dog will come start sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. When he does, make sure you pet under his chin at least once, say the word sit, and pet him as much or as little as you want. Now remember to use that watch word. So if you come in the room and you see somebody's petting one of the dogs and they're standing up, you say paycheck to that person. Even if that person did it right, they stop petting. Tells the dog to sit. If the dog sits, pet him on the chin, say sit. Say actually, I asked him to sit while you were making, getting some chili. Delicious chili in this house. Uh, if you're, while you're getting the chili, he stood up and I continued petting him and that's allowed. But thank you for reminding me because I do forget to pet without a purpose. 
And even if you want to pet the dog, you didn't ask for it, till tell them to sit, especially with Max. The more that he feels like he's earning that affection, the more confident he's going to be and the more that's going to really help him. Now, we also talked about passive training, or Taylor did. Uh, passive training is waiting for the dog to organically come to you or to sit down or to lay down, uh, eat their food. Taylor says uh, meatball and pizza. Uh, so when one of her dogs takes a bite of food, she says the word meatball. Well, when I hear meatball, there's food in my mouth. When the other dog hears meatball, there's no food in the mouth. So come up with a unique word for each dog to eat. So when they take their first bite of food for about four months, one time say sushi, fajita, uh, yiro. We're talking about Greek islands, I'm hungry. Um, chili. And so after a while, the dog knows that means I get to eat. And Taylor should eat after Max, if you can achieve it. Now, if Max won't eat in front of Taylor, it's possible. Make sure that Taylor's not staring at Max or standing in between. Taylor, I haven't seen it, but Taylor may try to intimidate. And eating is the most important activity for dogs. The guardians here are doing a great job. They eat first, which is really important. If you're going to go out to eat, just eat a carrot or something first. Then give Max permission to eat. When Max is done, Max leaves the area. And Taylor, and when Max is eating, Taylor's not allowed to be within seven feet of him. And if that intimidates, it might even be further. And when, uh, I would say when Taylor's eating, Max is not to be allowed to be around, but I don't think Max is going to try to challenge for it anyways. Um, so those are crucial. Those are super simple. Hey, Maxie. Um, those are really, really easy things that you can do. Because all it is, especially the passive training, because you're waiting for Max to do the things that you want. Every time he gets on the bed, call it Hilton, or whatever the funny word is that you want to say to go on the dog bed. And so we need to build up Max's confidence. A dog like him, I'd like to see him have 10 commands. I think he only has about two or three commands. And so if we can get him by uh, petting him when he does the things that we want, we can start building those other things and start build, boosting his self-esteem and confidence. Taylor. Yes. Like, I don't know, uh, maybe. Taylor, hey. Would you like a little crack? You don't want that chicken liver? You want one of these, huh? Are you full? It might be full. Now, if you know the dog likes the food, and it's a time when they normally would eat it, and they won't take it, now in this case it might be full because we just practiced a lot downstairs, but that could mean that he has cortisol in his blood, which stop, stops all the digestive process. Well, Taylor, uh, Taylor, puppy, puppy, baby. Well, this is Taylor's butt, <laughs> and this is, uh, and, uh, this is uh, Taylor and Max's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.